Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord as we have gathered together, as he has enabled us to be faithful to do so. And now that we have such restrictions on our gatherings, it really, we really should count it a privilege when we can come. Not that those of us here are more important than those of us online, but it's a privilege to know that we do come before the Lord and seek his face together as his people. And as we do that, let me invite you to stand with me as we just seek the Lord's face in prayer. Ask that he would be gracious to us again, his people, that he would lead us, that he would provide for us, that he would feed us with his word, guide us by his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we are found in your house today. We thank you for those, Lord, who are gathering online and who are also in your midst. For you are greater than any one place, Lord, who can contain the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lord of glory, the creator of the ends of the earth. As you said to your servant David, can you be contained in a house made with human hands? Surely not. You are far greater than anything we ever know. And we thank you, Lord, that we are found in your presence, covered by the blood of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that as we gather this day, as we do each time, that you would fill us afresh with your spirit, that we would know, Lord, a deeper experience of you in our lives. Lord, that we would know the deepening impact of your word in our lives, in our hearts, that you would further equip us for your service, and that everything that we do here in this place, and even through those who are gathered online, would bring glory and honor to your great name. So help us now in this time to which you've called us. Glorify your Son, even Lord Jesus Christ, for we pray in his name. Amen. Well, if you recall, last week our pastor left us hanging with the scriptures. The three Hebrew children were before the king, and he put a question to them that if they would just, just recant and just bow down and worship the image that he had set up, then all would be good. And we're going to find out what decision they made. And so we too have a decision that we need to make in our lives. And so we're going to sing this wonderful hymn, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Don't none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning. 
turning back No turning back No turning back Taken all to live and follow thee, destined to despise, forsaken thou from hence, my all shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought and hoped and known. Yet how rich is my condition, God and heaven are still my own. Let the world despise and leave me, they have left my Savior to human hearts and looks they see me. Thou art not like man untrue, and while thou shalt smile upon me, God of wisdom, love, and might, souls may hate and friends may shun me, show thy face and all is bright. They trouble and distress me, till but drive me to thy breast. Thy foot trials not may press me, and will bring thee sweet rest. Oh, is not in grief to harm me, while thy love is left to me. Not in joy to charm me, were that joy unmixed with me. Hasten on from grace to glory, armed by faith and winged by prayer, hems eternal days before me. God's own hand shall guide me there. Soon shall close my earthly mission. Swift shall pass my pilgrim days. Hope shall see me to glad fruition. Faith to sight and prayer to praise. A foundation, the saints of the Lord, it is laid for your faith in His excellent word. What more can He say than to you? He had said to you, who no refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, thou art with me, will be not this way, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. Fiery trials, thy pathway shall lie. My grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy trust to consume and thy gold to refine. 
soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That so though all hell should endeavor to shame, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Isn't that good news? You will never forsake his beloved. That's why we're here. We're kept by his power. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for that promise and for your keeping power, Lord, that causes us even to exist, let alone to be here before you. And I pray, Father, that we would learn day by day more and more to trust that we can stand upon you, upon your word. And though you have not promised to keep us from trials, you've promised to be with us in them and to bring us through them. Help us to have the right perspective as we trust, Lord, and go forward as we walk with you. Thank you for these words of encouragement that have been inspired in the songwriters of days gone by, but they're still true to us today because they're from your word, the truths contained therein. We thank you and praise you again, Lord, even as we rest upon this promise and know that it is indeed well with our souls because of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Him that has become a favorite to many, one that people have turned to over the ages because it speaks so well of our times of need and casting ourselves upon the God who has made us and knowing that because of him and what he does, we are indeed safe and it is well. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Oh, Satan, perfect, though trials should come. Let these blessed assurance control that Christ not regarded by helpless estate and that shed his own blood for my soul. It is with my soul it is well it is well with my soul my sin know oh, the bliss of this glorious God my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross 
and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. shall be signed, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the drum shall be sound, and the Lord shall descend, even though it is well. God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some the fire, but all through the blood, some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long, some through the water, some through the flood, some the fire, but all through the blood, some through great sorrow, but 
God gives the song in the night season and all the day long. Amen. You may be seated. And as we've been singing all this morning already, these are truths from God's Word. These, they're not just nice thoughts that someone has written down because they sound good or just to encourage people with empty promises, but they come straight from the Word of God. Passages such as Psalm 46, and we're going to read that now. Psalm 46. If you had a hymnal, it would also be reading number 702, but of course, straight from the Word of God, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Please take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. going to finish the chapter today. We left off verse 15 with the last refrain from Nebuchadnezzar. So we'll read Daniel chapter 3 beginning at verse 15 right through to the end of the chapter. The word of the Lord. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes and all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor were there a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and their was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubber, rub, rubble for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for your word. We thank you that indeed you are the most high God. There is none like you. Apart from you, there is no God. You are utterly unique and distinct from all things. And you are worthy of all praise and adoration and obedience and service. So Lord, be with us in this time as we would sit under your word that you would speak to our hearts and that the Holy Spirit would illumine our minds and transform our souls, that we would be conformed to your word. Help us to recognize the power of your word. It is the word of God. It is absolute in authority because it is your authority. It is not a book among books. It is the book. It is the Holy Bible, the word of God. So Lord, may this time be profitable, that we would be equipped for the work of the ministry, that you would give us things here, Lord, to, to change how we think and how we act and what we live for. Feed us and nourish us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. The topic of civil dis disobedience is one that we're probably very familiar with if we're watching the news or reading the reports and we see different uh, things that people are disobeying the government over, whether it's racial issues or whether it's um, churches being told that they must close and uh, that people are not allowed to gather to worship. Or we even see it in some other senses where just people refusing to wear masks or to social distance because how dare the government tell me what to do. We live in a very anti-authority age where um, the mantra is, you have no right to tell me what to do. I don't care whether you're the government or not. We're going to look a little bit later at the concept of civil disobedience from Scripture. And we see a wonderful example of civil disobedience here in chapter 3, where the king orders his subjects to perform uh, a certain act, and they refuse. Because that act puts them into direct conflict, not only with their beliefs, but with obedience to God himself. Violation here would be of the first and second commandments, we begin in verse 15. 
And we had seen before that Nebuchadnezzar had set up this, uh, this image of gold, this statue most likely representing the god Marduk in the plain of Dura. And he gathers all the governmental officials from throughout his, his empire and gathers them. The best historical reconstruction suggests that there was a rebellion that had gone on primarily in the ranks of his, of his military and that he had probably purged his government at this time, but he, after going throughout his empire, correcting, collecting uh, tribute and, and establishing his authority once again, he brings all of the leaders there to uh, take an act of, of patronage uh, to demonstrate their pledge of allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. And we saw that, that church and state cannot be separated in the ancient world. Everything was religious. And how people responded to this image uh, played on how they responded to Nebuchadnezzar and vice versa. Verse 15. Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? It is interesting to note that only three refuse. There must have been more representatives from Judea including perhaps the king. And yet only three refuse. Chapter 1. There must have been more Judean youths in Nebuchadnezzar's administrative program. And yet there were only four that refused to defile themselves with the king's food. This is something common to the Bible. It is something common to Christianity, where there are so many who profess faith, but there are so few that actually live by faith. There are so few that are utterly committed to the cause of Christ. Are we not told to die to self? Are we not told that we are slaves of Christ, that we are to obey? Obedience is better than sacrifice and yet so few truly obey the whole narrative is framed as a battle of world views on the one hand we see the pagan polytheistic superstitious worldview of the Babylonians and also all the pagan uh, nations that have, have come and gathered and are subservient to Nebuchadnezzar and on the other hand, the biblical monotheistic worldview of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Commentator Sharon Pace writes, The actions of the three young men threaten Nebuchadnezzar himself, for by not serving the deities that sanction his rule, give him prosperity, and protect his very life, they denigrate the king's royal standing. The author shows that for Nebuchadnezzar, their refusal is not only a religious act, it is a thoroughly political one, namely disloyalty to the state. In the Babylonian worldview, the burning of the guilty criminal would be viewed as a divine event. It wouldn't be considered that the flames consumed, but the God caused the flames to consume. According to scholar Tawny Holm, the gods, especially Marduk, Nergal, and Geru, often uh, were said in the penalty clauses of treaties to burn enemies with fire. According to Holm, the gods were directly involved in the burning. It was a supernatural judgment, not merely a natural one. So it would have been considered not that they were consumed by the fiery furnace so much as it was the supernatural judgment of the gods of Babylon, particularly the god represented in the image, the god Marduk. And so we see if we understand the text correctly, if we understand the culture correctly, that really this is a, 
a, a, another Mount Carmel situation where we have the battle of the gods. There it was Baal versus Yahweh. Here it's not just Marduk, but probably the Babylonian pantheon versus Yahweh. And in verse uh, 15, a direct challenge is made to Yahweh, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Because Nebuchadnezzar sees that he is the favor of Marduk, he is the favor of the supreme God. Therefore, who can oppose him? And so a challenge is issued. And we know that Nebuchadnezzar has, has done this before. We are told in the book of Jeremiah, for instance, if you turn to Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, In Jeremiah chapter 29, we see that, that Nebuchadnezzar uses the word roasted in the, uh, the ESV. But in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 22 and 23, it says, uh, Because of them, all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon will use this curse. The Lord treat you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burned in the fire. For they have done outrageous things in Israel. They have committed adultery with their neighbors, wives, and in my name have spoken lies, which I did not tell them to do. I know it, and I'm a witness to it, declares the Lord. So we know from Jeremiah that Nebuchadnezzar had executed other people by means of fire. And here, most likely, uh, there was a pragmatic reason for him to do it. There would have been a furnace sitting right there used in the production of the statue. Probably had the smoke billowing at it. Uh, a terrorizing thing for those there. And Nebuchadnezzar says, if you don't obey, this is what awaits you. And we have this wonderful response from the three young men. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. This is not a statement of belligerence or rudeness. They're saying, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, you're willing to give us another chance? But there's no point. There's nothing you can say or do that's going to make us change our minds and to bow down and worship this, this idol. We know what the consequences are, and we are willing to endure those consequences for the sake of conscience and for the sake of obedience to our God. For them, this is an act of worship. Obedience is an act of worship. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So they're still speaking politely. They're not trying to rouse the anger of the king further. They don't want to die, but they would rather die than disobey. They would rather obey God, take the consequences, and ultimately leave the matter in God's hands. Our God is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Their theology tells them that their God is able to do whatever he wants. They would know the stories of the Old Testament, of how God created a universe out of nothing, how God fashioned the man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. They would know how God caused a global flood to come and purge the earth. They would know how God led the children of Israel out of bondage and how he opened up the sea so that they could walk on dry land and how he did it over the, the Jordan River and all the miracles in the desert and in the conquest. They had seen the mighty hand of God over and over and over and over again and knew that nothing was impossible with God. 
And so if God wanted to deliver them from the fiery furnace, God could deliver them from the fiery furnace. Their God was able. Their God wasn't impotent or lacking in anything. Their God was in nothing in comparison to the pagan gods who were finite, who were limited, who were capricious. Their God was the one true God who has no limitations. For as Jesus said, there is nothing impossible with God. And so they knew this to be true of their God. Our God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. By the way, this is a religious challenge to Nebuchadnezzar and why he gets madder and madder and madder. They don't just say, no thanks, we'll take the furnace. Just like Daniel used it as an opportunity to speak concerning his God in chapter 2, here we see they take the opportunity in the midst of this to speak concerning God. Nebuchadnezzar, you can do this, and we realize that there, 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 there's a supernatural component that you see in this, that this is the judgment of your God, but our God is the one who is able. And it doesn't matter who you call God, our God, the living God, is able. And so they are not only directly challenging the authority of Nebuchadnezzar, but they are challenging the power of his gods. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. They don't know this, but just like we are told to pray in faith and to believe that God can and will, they are believing that God will. But they put the proviso in here, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, saying, but if not, it's not because he's impotent. It's because in his divine wisdom he has chosen not to for his own purposes. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. If you were to turn for a second to Hebrews chapter 11, we see all these cases of these faithful men and women. And we see so often how God supernaturally works through them and delivers them. And some people are under the false perception that if our faith is strong enough, then it will always turn out well for us. We'll always get what we want. This is all part and partial with the, the prosperity gospel, which is no gospel at all. It's a cult. It's a humanistic cult. But look at Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 36. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. It's because their faith wasn't strong enough, right? No, not at all. In fact, the whole chapter is about the wondrous faith of these people in their God. And notice what it says in the next verse. The world was not worthy of them. They so reflected the nature and character of God. They so lived by faith that it says the world was not worthy of them. God does not always deliver in the way in which we want him to. He is always able, but we don't know the big picture. Look at all the martyrs throughout history. And the day may come for us. When we face such a challenge, and even if we stand on absolute faith, it does not guarantee that God will deliver us from the immediate consequences. But he will always ultimately deliver us through the blood of Christ. We sang that this morning, didn't we? Some through the fire, some through the flood. But it says all through the blood. They committed an act of what is known as civil disobedience. They were disobedient to the state. They were disobedient to the king. 
And sadly, we do not have enough instruction about this nowadays in our, in our churches. And perhaps because of what's going on, we need to have a lot more of it. Uh, no longer can we assume that people are reading and studying their Bibles and that they know these things by a matter of fact. But what does the Bible say concerning this? Well, it has a bit to say on it. So let's start in Romans chapter 13. We're just going to be in this just very, very briefly. I'll leave it to you to go and study this more, more on your, note, your own. But evangelicals are basically in agreement concerning the fact that disobedience, civil disobedience, should only be exercised in the major issues, not in the minor issues. So when people are committing civil disobedience and believe that the Bible is, is supporting them, uh, about wearing masks or social distancing and things like that. Uh, the Bible is not on their side in that. When it comes to things like the state saying that you're not allowed to worship God, that's a completely different issue. And we'll see that more in Daniel chapter 6. Romans chapter 13. Now notice the language here. It's very clear and cut and dry. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. Now you have to understand when Paul is writing this. Paul ministered under two of the most ruthless, despicable emperors. Caligula and Nero. He's not writing to governments that, that are, you know, following point by point what the scriptures teach. And of course, Paul, in, in, in your generation, it would be easy to submit to authorities. You don't know what our government's like. No, no, Paul is writing this at a time where the Roman powers were so pagan and anti-Christian, anti-God. And he says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. So those two hinge together. It doesn't matter if it's Nero or who it is. The scriptures confirm they were established by God. Okay. The government was established by God. The authorities that exist have been what? Established by God. Nero didn't find himself there because of Nero. Ultimately, in the big scheme of things, Nebuchadnezzar was king, we we're told, because of God. Nero became king because of God. Trump is president because of God. Trudeau is prime minister because of God. And it doesn't matter what you think of them. Biblically, God is the one who establishes those in authority. That's why we are told that we are to pray for them. Now, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily there for good reasons. They could be there to judge us. It could be a penalty from God. But nevertheless, we are told to submit to them. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is what? rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will be bringing judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Really, the purpose of government is to bless and support those who do good and to punish those who do evil. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and he will commend you for he is God's servant. He's saying Nero is God's servant. He would be saying Nebuchadnezzar is God's servant. To do good, that's their purpose. But if you do wrong, be afraid. Remember when you were a kid and you were told two wrongs don't make a right? Well, that's here. The government may not be following what God tells them to do, but nevertheless, we are to obey the government. To not do so would be 
wrong. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. God has empowered them to discipline. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also because of conscience. So this is in your relationship to God. Some people don't speed because they're just afraid of getting a ticket. Some people don't speed because they know it's the right thing to do. There's a huge difference, right? It's like the Bible talks about sorrow. It talks about worldly sorrow and it talks about godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Both of them are sorrow, but they're two totally different things. In the first case, somebody's sorry because they got caught. In the other case, they're sorry because they've offended God. They've sinned against God. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Okay, there don't seem to be any loopholes there whatsoever. Now we'll see that scripture gives us a few examples of some loopholes. So turn next to Titus chapter 3. Just a, a short, simple statement here in Titus. But in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, remind the people, be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, be peaceable and considerate, to show true humility toward all men. Again, the same context under the Neronian persecution in the midst of all of this, Remember what Nero was doing to Christians. Okay, Paul himself had been in prison many times. Ultimately, he was put to death by the Romans for preaching the gospel. But he says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Okay, one last one. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right, for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a covering, cover up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. So far the scriptures tell us that the general principle is obey the government. Do what the government says. So, what are the exceptions? Well, there are very few that we see in Scripture. Very few. If you turn to Exodus chapter 1, you see an example there. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Then a new king who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. Okay, so then they try to submit them through through slavery and, and uh, getting the work hard in that, but they're still reproducing like crazy. So in verse 15, it says, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. Okay, so we've got to do something for population control here of these, 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 these Israelites. So what are we going to do? We're just, every male that's born, we're just going to kill the male. And that's just going to, cut the birth rate in half, 
and uh, especially in that culture, only the men did the, the fighting. So we're going to basically get rid of a generation of, of the military that could possibly rise up to, uh, to fight against us. Now, what did they do? Well, it says the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? Now they lie right through their teeth. And God doesn't support lying at all. The Bible says that God hates lying. He hates it. What he is favorable to was their obedience to him, their fear of him, but not their lying. Okay, so they say the women are vigorous and give birth before the midwives. Why? Now notice what verse 20 says. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. Okay, God didn't approve of the lying, but he approved of their disobedience of the king's mandate to murder these children. Thou shalt not kill. Better murder. This was a violation of the word of God. Hey, there's only a couple other examples. We see one in the book of, of Esther, which is a very mild one. It's more heroism than civil disobedience. But remember, she's, she's told to go in and ask the king. She says, I can't go in there. Nobody's allowed to go and see the king unless the king summons them. So what does she do? She just runs in anyways because they're trying to exterminate her people. In fact, the king had signed a law to exterminate the people. And so she rushes in and the king receives her warmly and the people are saved. So in one sense, that's, a, that's civil disobedience because what was going on was contrary to the word of God. And so she risked it for that. Uh, really, the next one would be Daniel chapter 3. After that, Daniel chapter 6, which is Daniel in the lion's den, where Daniel ref refuses to stop praying to God. In fact, he's so bold that he doesn't even go and hide, but he continues to pray in front of the window for all to see. And God delivers him, even though that was a direct confrontation of the, the king's edict, that they were not allowed to, to pray to any other god for that period of time. One last one is in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we see that just after the ascension of Christ and the, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that the apostles are out preaching the gospel. And in preaching the gospel, they are taken and arrested and thrown in jail and they are told that they are not allowed to do that anymore. And they say no. They say that, among other things, they are to obey God rather than man. Verse 19 of chapter 4, Acts 4 but Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. What we see as a general principle of civil disobedience is if the government commands you to do evil, to violate the word of God, then you are to disobey. You are to obey God rather than man. In Daniel chapter 3, it was a direct violation of the word of God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. No images of God. You're not to bow down before idols. Therefore, they could not do it and still obey God. The two were at odds. You must choose between the two. You're either going to obey God or disobey God. And we are to always obey Obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't come and do all your churchy stuff and then disobey God. 
Your churchy stuff means nothing. It's not worship. It's just religious activity. And so, look through Scripture, study the issue for yourself. Where you see the debate among evangelical ethicists is, to what extent can we disobey? Can it be open rebellion? Can it be violence? Can it be overturning a government? It is nothing to do with these small issues. No one in their right mind would twist scripture to say, well, if the government tells me to wear a mask, then that's violating my biblical rights. Where is that in the Bible? If the government says, you can no longer read the word of God, that's a case for civil disobedience. If the government says you cannot worship God anymore, if the government says you can't assemble that's the case for civil disobedience. Now, right now we assemble physically and, and via Zoom, but we're not talking in the midst of a pandemic. If, if after the pandemic's uh, over and there's no uh, health threat or anything, the government just says, you know what? No more churches. We're just shutting them all down, and it's now against the law to assemble together to worship God. God commands that we assemble. Do not forsake the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. By the way, I'm going to preach on that at some point in the near future. But notice how it ends. And even more so as the days are approaching. As the appearing of Christ gets closer and closer, Scripture says it's more and more important that you do assemble together. So the worse it gets out there, the more important it is that we gather together. Okay, back to Daniel chapter 3. So in this case, civil disobedience is not only right, but necessary. To not disobey would be to commit rebellion, treason, disobedience against God. And we should be much more afraid of God than of man, as Scripture teaches us. Okay, so they say no. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, the, the Hebrew there, or the Aramaic there, gives the idea his face was contorted. You, you've seen somebody who's literally about to blow their stack, and sometimes their face just, they don't look the same. So he, he's, he's about as mad as he can get. Now remember, rebellion's just gone on in his ranks. Everybody, the who's who's all there. He's got to deal with this appropriately. With a rod of iron so that nobody else is going to get any such idea. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Everybody agrees that this is not a literal seven times, but it's a proverbial statement, meaning as hot as possible. Now, in some sense, wouldn't you think as cool as possible? Because then it's going to take longer. But it parallels his rage. Let's, let's incinerate them. By the way, one uh, combustion engineer, uh, an evangelical, did the calculations. And if you were going to make it seven times hotter, they'd actually have to make it hotter than the surface temperature of the sun. So in that world, they couldn't have even done it anyways. Okay, um, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, tunics, uh, their hats, and their other garments and were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Now, he's not telling us what they dressed so that we have an idea of what they wore back then. He's telling us that what they wore was highly flammable. Okay? Everything they had was going to catch fire. They may as well have doused them with gasoline. And they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Now we have a little note after because the king's order was so urgent and the fire furnace overheated, the flames of the fire killed those men who 
uh, took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he gets strong soldiers. We don't know why. Uh, probably the best reason scholarly, the way he had some of the strongest men, was Nebuchadnezzar is viewing this as a spiritual and physical thing that's going on. So he wants to make sure that uh, he not only needs his God on his side, but let's get the strongest men to help to make sure that everything's going to go our way. Now, the Aramaic could mean either the heat killed these guys or the wind changed or something and some flames came out and killed them. But either way, these strong men are killed. Um, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Ben, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. So they fall in the top. So then it's just a matter of moments before they're, they're dead. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. A few translations have the Son of God, but that's a poor translation because this is coming from the lips of Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying this one looks like a divine being of some sort. So later on, Nebuchadnezzar calls it an angel, but there again, he just means a divine being. So he says this one's a divine being down there. So a representative from the gods has come. Historically, evangelicals have always interpreted this as a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. This is the eternal Son of God in a theophany, taking a, a physical form that's in the midst with them. Okay, but the text says one like Son of the Gods. This is going to come up later on again in Daniel chapter 7, where we see at the second coming there, the, the Father descends, who is called the Ancient of Days, and then one like the Son of Man descends on the, on the clouds. And that's why Christ most common descriptor or epithet for himself is the son of man. Notice that they were not delivered from the fire, but in the fire. Now there are reasons for that. The, the clearest reason is, how would God's power be best put on display in this? From keeping them out or preserving them in the midst of? Especially as some older commentators understood that this would not only be a battle against against uh, 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 Marduk but the Babylonians also had a god of fire so this would be his Yahweh overcoming the god of fire as well Charles Bockel who is a combustion engineer who wrote a theological argument on this says apparently God did not alter the fire since the soldiers were consumed but somehow he protected the three conscientious objectors did their bodies and clothes temporarily become flame retardant? How did they even breathe in a hot, smoky furnace that would normally not have enough oxygen in it for people to survive? God covered all the bases. Oxygen deprived, you know. What, often in, in burning houses, people don't die immediately from the flames. They die of smoke inhalation. They don't die of smoke inhalation. They don't die from the heat. They don't die from the flames. Herbert Lockyer wrote this. He says, not only did God arrest the action of the intense heat in the hour of trial, but he also condescended to become their companion in the furnace. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God was in the furnace with them. That's why I love that footprints poem, right? We think that we're all alone and God has somehow abandoned us. And yet he says in that poem that, my child, that's when I was carrying you through. God is in the fire with us. And so uh, God doesn't just keep them alive, but he, he goes over and above to show his power and supremacy. You know, it says concerning them that they, in a second here, that they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. 
Man, I go and barbecue. And I have the smell of smoke on me. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, prefects, and governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. No wonder they'd gather together. Wouldn't you want to go see that? What do you mean somebody was thrown in there and they're walking around? There's an apocryphal edition called the Song of the Three Young Men where they're, they're singing a song while they're in the middle of it. And saw that the fire had not any power over their bodies. The hair on their heads was not singed. Okay, again, using my barbecue illustration, the odd time when I had my old barbecue, I'd have to let the gas go for a long time before it ignite, and once or twice, and I got my eyebrows singed. It doesn't take much, right? They're in a furnace that's designed to melt metal. And it says that it had no power over them. By the way, that phrase there, it had any power over them, is a religious statement. Because remember, it's a supernatural punishment. So in essence, what they're saying is the Babylonian gods had no power over them. I was reminded this week by uh, reading a post and somebody was talking about the, the church in North America and the church in North America is, is, is shrinking like crazy. Not only are they discerning that more and more and more and more and more people in our churches are, are unconverted, but in our culture, by and large, people have no interest in church. No interest. They don't want to come and see. Just no thanks. And so the numbers are shrinking. I've told you before, for every church that opens, three close. But worldwide, the church is growing like crazy. Primarily in the third world. The underground churches in China I mentioned uh, last time about how there's basically a revival breaking out in Iran right now. Why? Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail over it. We think it's our job. God said in Christ, I will build my church. And nothing will stop that. The gods of Babylon had no power over Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The furnace had no power over them other than what God grants. God is sovereign even over the flames, over any circumstance. Now, he may have chosen to let them burn in the fire. As we saw in Hebrews chapter 11, God doesn't rescue everyone. Isaiah was sawed in two. What happened to John the Baptist? How was he delivered? With his head on a plate. Look at the martyrs in the book of Revelation. A, a multitude that no one can count. They were killed for their faith. But in the end they were all delivered by the hand of God. Paul says that our present sufferings, no matter what they are, cannot be compared with that which awaits us. He says that, Scripture says that it hasn't even entered into the heart of man what awaits for us. You can't conceive it. So they all gather. It says the hair on their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Now, stop here for a second. Why did God rescue them? The text tells us. And do not say it was because of their faith. God did it for God. They were the recipients of God's grace and mercy, right? 
but it was penultimate. The ultimate reason why God delivered them so that the world would know that God is the most high God and he is to be worshipped. So where does all the attention go? It shifts from Nebuchadnezzar, the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to God. He says, their God, the God whom you serve and worship, he's the one that delivered you. Blessed be, but it, it turns into a worship service, not for the pagan idol, but for the God of heaven and earth. Okay, who has delivered his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. And look at what it says. And set aside the king's command. He's saying, they disobeyed me. But inadvertently saying, they were right to do it. And yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language, or speak anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Okay, the prosperity gospel, people are going to say, well, if you're faithful, you're going to get promoted. Well, we can take scripture and just find if you're faithful, you're going to get put to death. So don't twist scripture. In their case, God was gracious. Some people want to use Job. Yeah, look at Job. Look, in the end, he got all this stuff. Really, you want to go through what he went through to get that? He lost everything. Everything. But God was glorified. If we commit civil disobedience, it must be for that purpose so that God is glorified. It must be done in a way that God is glorified. Is God glorified in the preaching of the gospel? Therefore, for the authorities to say, you cannot preach the gospel, God is glorified in disobedience to that command because we are proclaiming the gospel in obedience to the Lord. I want you to think about this deeply, about how we look at what we do and how we evaluate what the government says we're to do and not do. And to think through that lens of, is what I'm doing or about to do or thinking about doing, is that going to bring glory to God? Is this about God or is this about me? Charles Ryrie wrote an article decades ago on the Christian and civil disobedience. And he came to the conclusion at the end of it, and he put it this way. He said, in those rare, rare occasions when the Christian is forced to commit civil disobedience because it is to obey God or man, he says, we need to evaluate it this way. Is it about my rights or is it about my God-ordained rights that God has called me to? Are we making it about us or are we making it about God? Are we glorifying God? Are we obeying God? Or is it out of selfish ambition? Okay, I think scripture leads it to conscience on to where you're going to set that line for disobedience to the government. But what we clearly see, and all evangelicals are in agreement on this, is the bar is set high. It should be rare, and it should be obvious when we disobey. Because God has established government. God has told us that we are to obey. And unless it, is a contra uh, it, it contradicts the word of God and pits us against God, we are to obey the government. Now, we are to influence the government and all these things. Don't forget all of that. We need to have godly men and women in our governments. But we need to recognize the big picture. Are we glorifying God in all things? Or are we seeking to glorify self? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which instructs us that it's so relevant 
It's always relevant. And I pray, Lord, as we are living in very tumultuous days, that we would have the faith, the tenacity of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which would rather suffer awful consequences than, Lord, to compromise their faith, to compromise their relationship with you. So, Lord, give us such faith that we would always want to obey, that we would always want to honor you, to glorify you, to worship you with our lives. And, Lord, someday, perhaps even soon, uh, we might be faced with some harsh and hard decisions that we need to make. Help us to be faithful. Give us wisdom. And, Lord, help us to always do the right thing. For Jesus' sake. Amen. As we come to the close, let's stand together and sing in response this very well-known hymn that was actually based on the scripture that we read earlier on Psalm 46, also known as the Reformer's Hymn, it speaks of the fact that our God is a mighty fortress and he delivers us, but we must take a stand knowing he is who he is. If we have our hymnals, it would be number 26, but the mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper the flood of mortal hills prevailing. For still our ancient foe would seek to work us wrong. His craft and power our grace and our with cruel on earth is not his evil. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side? The man of God don't you? Just as good that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, Lord, suffer all this pain, from age to age the same, and He must win the battle. Devils fail to threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God has will. His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble. Not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him, that word above all earthly powers. No thanks to them abide this. The Spirit and the gifts are ours. Through Him who with us this. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. The body they may kill God's truth abide
stand still. His kingdom is forever.